This is the introductory video for the pendulum experiment of the Physics 1101-1120 labs. So right now I have the camera pulled way back just so you can see the whole apparatus, but I will show you a close-up of all of this in a moment. So the apparatus consists of, first of all, a meter stick, and hanging right beside it, we've got the pendulum, which is just a ball on a string. Down at the bottom of this, you see that we've got a photo gate, and it's at the right height such that when the ball swings back and forth, it's going to cut the beam. We're going to be using a computer program to time how long the period of the pendulum is. We also have a little bracket here, which is going to allow us to adjust the length of the pendulum very quickly. So you can loosen this clamp and move it up and down, and then the length of the pendulum is going to be defined as being from the bottom of this to the center of the ball. If you decide you want to use a one meter long pendulum, then you could actually move this guy right out of your way entirely, like so, and let it swing the entire length of the string. Now what we're going to be measuring is the length of the pendulum and the time it takes for one complete back and forth oscillation. And to get good accurate results, we're going to be taking an average of 10 swings. So here's the close-up of the apparatus. The theory that we're verifying in this experiment is equation one in your lab manual. And you'll notice that there's only two variables in it. There's t, which is the period of the pendulum. That's the time for one complete back and forth oscillation. And there's l, which is the length of the pendulum. So that again is defined as being from the bottom of this bracket to the center of the ball. As I mentioned, there is a computer program that is gonna time 10 periods for us. I'll show you that program on screen in a moment and the length of the pendulum we can determine from this meter stick that's hanging beside it. Now one thing to be aware of is the meter stick goes from zero at the top to 100 at the bottom, which is not ideal for our purposes, because if the bracket here is at 60 centimeters, the length of the pendulum is actually 40 centimeters. So just keep that in mind. You should also think about what your uncertainties are. You'll have reading uncertainty, of course, but also how accurately is the center of this ball right at the bottom of the meter stick? and how accurately can you estimate where the center of the ball is. So think about that, that gives you a source of physical uncertainty on top of the reading uncertainty of the ruler. In order to measure the period correctly, you move the photo gate back here such that when the ball swings, it's gonna block that beam. Now the photo gate beam does not need to be centered on the middle of the ball, it just needs to be at a height where the ball will block it on its way past. So this should work fine. Something to be aware of regarding the program is that it will start and stop automatically. What you're going to do is you're going to move the ball out beyond the beam, very small oscillation, and let it swing back and forth. And the program will start when the ball goes through it the first time, and it'll keep going through the second pass and stop on the third one. So first one turns it on, and then it needs to get back to where it started before it turns it off. So that's actually the third time that the beam gets blocked. So that could be a little confusing, is that you actually do want the ball going through the beam three times in order to measure one complete period. Another thing to be aware of is that the theory that we're verifying in this experiment is actually only valid for small angle oscillations. So that means if you've got a big pendulum swing like this, the data that you get will not give you a linear graph. So we want to use just small angle oscillations. So basically you want to pull the ball back just enough that it completely clears the photo gate beam and that's all the oscillation that you want. So just a very small one. Do make sure that it completely clears the photo gate beam on this side and on this side. But other than that, you want the smallest oscillation possible. Another issue that's related to that is even when you have a very small angle oscillation like this, if the pendulum is really short, for example, if it's like this, then even though I'm not moving the ball very much, it's still actually a large angle. So like I said before, that means the theory we're using would not be valid for this. So for that reason, I recommend that you use pendulum lengths no shorter than 30 centimeters. So that distance should be no shorter than 30 centimeters. In order to get a good graph, however, you do want to span the maximum possible range of lengths of the pendulum. So that means 30 centimeters should be your minimum, and you should go right up to 100 centimeters as your maximum. You need six to eight data points in order to get a decent graph. So you set the various lengths of the pendulum and you time the periods for each of them. So here's a side view so I can show you something to be wary of. As I mentioned, you want to make sure that the ball completely clears the photo gate beam in both directions. So that means when the ball is swung to its maximum height over here or over here, the beam in the middle is completely unblocked by the ball. If you've got a really small oscillation, something like this, 
you might find that that's not the case, that maybe the ball clears the beam on this side, but not on this side of its swing. And if that's the case, you're actually going to be measuring two times the period rather than one times the period. That just comes down to the fact that the program is, needs to be triggered three times to measure one complete oscillation. So it starts timing on the first pass, lets the ball swing back, and then stops timing on the third pass. So if you're not clearing the beam, what's going to happen is the first swing will turn it on, the second swing will leave it running, and the third swing will be the one that turns it off. So you'll actually be measuring two complete oscillations rather than one. So that's why I say it's important to make sure that the ball is going to completely clear the beam in both directions. So, as usual, go into the Photogate VIs folder, and this week we're going to use the Pendulum Timer program. So that looks like this, and as usual, you click the single white arrow, and you wait for this button to turn green. And at that point, you can pull your pendulum back and start it swinging. The program will automatically start and stop taking data, so you just let it swing, and when it's got 10, it's going to give you the average value, and you are welcome to use this average value along with an uncertainty of 1% for the photo gate. Once it's finished taking data, if you want to do another run, you just click the white arrow again, again wait for this button to turn green, and then start your pendulum swinging. This is equation 1 in your lab manual. The point of this experiment is that we're going to get an experimental value for g, the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth, and we're going to compare it to the known value. So you will have an experimental value for g, and you compare that to 9.81 to see whether your value agrees with an uncertainty with the known value. Now the way in which we're going to do this is we're going to graphically verify this equation. So graphically verifying it means that you take your data and you graph it. It does not mean that you stick t and l values in here and solve for g. It means that you're going to take t and l, you'll make a graph of that data, and then you'll solve for g from your slope. Now looking at this equation, one thing you should immediately notice is that t and l do not have a linear relationship with each other. There's this square root symbol in here. That means if you graph t versus l, you will not get a straight line graph and you won't be able to solve for your g value. So what you need to do is linearize this equation. If you go back to the front of your lab manual and read through the graphing section, there is a section on how to linearize data. I strongly recommend you read this before you come to the lab and think about how you're going to linearize this equation. In other words, how you're going to graph your data such that you do get a straight line graph. Once you figure that out, you'll graph your data the appropriate way, and what you should find is that your slope will not be equal to g, but it will be equal to something that involves g. So what you'll do is you'll take your experimental slope, a number, and you'll set it equal to the quantity that you theoretically expect your slope to be equal to, and then you solve for g. So again, just to be clear, the slope will not equal g. You have to use your slope in order to solve for g. And that will only work if you've appropriately linearized this equation before you graphed things.